Lord. We love to have you here. You're always welcome. You and your Holy Spirit are always welcome here. Jesus, we just love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. We love you with everything we got. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being our Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for conquering death for us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise your name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise your Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed Lord. Blessed Lord. Blessed Lord. Praise your Lord. Praise your Lord. I have a message this morning that I believe the Lord laid upon my heart. And I believe that at some point during this message, I'm going to disappear behind this podium. And Jesus is going to be speaking to you directly. It may not even be anything that I say. He may, he may speak to you something completely different than I've said. I've had this happen several times where people come up to me afterwards and they said, well, when you said such and such, and I went back and looked over the tape, and I didn't say it. It wasn't in there. <laughs> so he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to you today. If you have an ear to hear, you'll hear. If you are interested in giving uh, and finding and supporting this uh, fellowship there is a black box over to my right be to your left and uh, you and, there, and there's offering envelopes over there that you can fill out for your tax uh, tax benefits and uh, I encourage you to do that if you want to support us if you're online and you want to support us you can either go to the website uh, light of Yeshua fellowship org and there is a, a thing that says type, uh, tithes and offerings, and you click on that, it'll take you to a secure giving uh, place where you can give securely over the, over the internet. Also, if you'd like, uh, we also have text giving, and on the right, of the bottom of the screen, uh, where you're looking uh, is the number for the text giving. And so, uh, uh, if you want to type in that number and then just type the word give and text, uh, text your giving, that would be awesome. I believe that God wants this message to come out into the world, and um, we're going to get there. You want to find in your Bibles the book of Esther. The book of Esther. Esther. <laughs> And we're going to start in the third chapter. We're going to start in the middle of it here. Because I'm not going to talk about Esther tonight as much as I am going to be talking about Mordecai and Haman. You've probably heard many sermons about Esther and about how that this is, uh, that you know, you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And there's wonderful messages that can be taken out of that scripture. And, and there's other, other messages as well. I've, I've actually preached on Esther before uh, several years ago, and there, there may be a video out there somewhere uh, of that teaching. But I'm going to talk today a little more about Mordecai. And so today's message is titled, Morde What's Up With Mordecai? What's Up With Mordecai? So we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but... I want to read several verses here in chapter 3 because this is going to be our, our central point and then we're going to cover quite a bit of the rest of the book as well. It says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, 
But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, and said unto Mordecai, Why transgresseth you the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told him that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. That's the month we're in. We're in the month of Adar. We're in the twelfth month. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it unto the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand, gave it unto Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were in every province, and to the rulers of every people in every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written, and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Now I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to hand out this calendar and you can kind of pass it around. I have circled the 14th day of the 12th month, which is uh, coming up here. And uh, if you, I want you to notice that not only is it Purim, but also it's also the day that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're going to make, I'm going to show you a connection with this in just a minute. You know, nothing is, Jesus didn't do anything by accident. He purposely he purposely raised Jesus, Lazarus from the dead on Purim for a reason. That's why he waited till Purim to raise him from the dead. It's so good. It's so good. But anyway, we're going to get there. So let's first of all, let's, let's, let's figure out how in the world these people get in this, uh, in this situation they're in in the first place. Because years before the Babylonians had come in and Nebuchadnezzar, and he had come in, and, and he had took, uh, took Jerusalem, and he took the, uh, took the whole city. He, he completely destroyed the temple, laid it flat, and he took captive the, the, the southern kingdom. And he deported many of them up to, uh, up to Babylon. And so then years pass, right? And so then we have the, the uh, Medes and the Persians come along, and they defeat the Babylonians. And so then uh, the Medes and Persians rule for a little while, and then the Medes and the, then the Medes and, uh, then the, then comes the then comes the uh, uh, the nation of Persia, and Persia comes and he, they take over the Medes and the Persia, Medes and, and so the Persia now is the ruling thing. They take over the whole thing. So P Persia now is the ruling ruling part of of, of this whole uh, empire that they that they've created by their conquest. And Israel is, is coming, and they're actually being servants to this king. So that's kind of a short, short story of, the, of, of how, this all, uh, how this all came about. And so uh, 
they are they are in captivity. They're they're in what's called the 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 Hebrew word is galut, galut. They are they are in they they have been they have been uh, they have been cast out of their land. They 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 are they are refugees. They are they're literally cast out of their land. And so uh, this is all uh, part of a prophecy, right? But Esther is standing there, and. Uh, the the king has this big big uh, banquet and and uh, he in the middle of the banquet he decides he wants to have his wife Vashti to come forth and to show herself and Vashti doesn't want to do that Vashti's just having her own little party somewhere else and there's a whole good sermon about that but I won't get into that but anyway so she's having her own little party she doesn't want to come to the king's party and so. Uh, it reminds me of the church today. They have their own, they have their own holidays, and they don't want to come to the king's holidays. Uh, so, you know, we just, uh, <laughs> they, they, we, we, we'd rather have our own holidays than the king's holidays. But they're, they're, so that, that's all I'm going to say because I'll, I'll, I'll spend an hour and a half on that part and won't get to my, my, my message. <laughs> so, so anyway, we've got, we've got the, we've got, uh, uh, so, so Vesti then, because she won't come, uh, they they pass a law that that uh, that all men have to uh, that that all men have to be the ruler of their household. Uh, I don't know in the world you would enforce such a law, but anyway, they made this a law of the land that the women was going to have to uh, you know reverence their husbands and and uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, I, I just think that it's it's a fun, it, to me it's a funny law, but they they made that law anyway. And so now now the king is looking for another queen. And so they have a beauty contest and and Esther enters the beauty contest. And over the period of time she goes into the king and and the king falls in love with her. And so he makes her king instead of Ashti, or queen instead of Ashti. Esther has not revealed to, to the king that she is the Jewess. She has not said anything about her nationality now actually Esther is actually a Benjamite all right she's actually not from the tribe of Judah but if you understand what happened the, the southern kingdom was made up of Judah Benjamin and Levi Levi okay Levites so when the Babylonians took them they took them from the kingdom of Judah and so they just kind of lumped all three of those tribes into one name like we do today we call them all Jews even though they're probably uh, one or three tribes, and we, you know, uh, and some of them know what their tribe. Most of them won't know what their tribes are. Like Benjamin Netanyahu, most people think he's a Jew, but he's not. He's a ben he's a ben he's the tribe of the Benjamin. Benjamin Netanyahu is the tribe of Benjamin. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, he's he's very plain about the fact that he's a Benjaminite, not not a not a Jew. But but because because he's from that, that country of Israel, we kind of lump them all. And the same thing was happening here, that, that they all got lumped together even though they were Benjamites. M Mordecai is a Benjamite. Now, Mordecai, we, we, we introduced the Mordecai. Now, Mordecai had taken in Esther as, because Esther had lost her mother and her father. So she was an orphan. And he took it was his brother. It was his uncle's actually Mordecai's uncle's daughter. And so he takes takes uh, uh, um, Esther in. Now Esther's actually Hebrew name is uh, is uh, Hadassah, which means Myrtle, but uh, uh, they they have a Persian name. Uh, Mordecai is also a Persian name. And so uh, uh, the. Esther comes along and she's raised by Mordecai. Now she's been she's made this uh, wonderful transition. She's now princess. She's now the queen of the of the nation. And uh, Mordecai is one of the servants that are, that is in in the courtroom of, of the of the of the palace. Now there must have been a lot of servants because when Haman doesn't bow. Uh, when Mordecai, I'm sorry, when Mordecai doesn't bow to Haman, Haman doesn't even re realize that it's Mordecai, not, that Mordecai's not bowing until all the other servants come to, Morde uh, it comes to Haman and say, says Mordecai's not bowing. Then he starts noticing that Mordecai's not bowing. So they must have had 
hundreds of servants out there to, to, not, to not see one person not bowing, all right? So, you know, however, however that uh, uh, Mordecai got away with not bowing, I don't know. Now, here's something that we've been taught that is totally wrong about this story. We've been taught that the reason that Mordecai didn't bow is because that he would not, he would not, uh, it, was a, it was a question of worship. But there is nothing in the Torah that forbids us to bow before one another. Nothing in the Torah that says that. Now, to bow in worship, that's a different thing. But there's nothing in the Torah that says that we don't have a, a respectful bow before each other or to open the door for each other, okay? Bowing is kind of like, you know, is this a sign of respect? In the Eastern uh, countries, bowing is, is very common among them. It's a sign of respect to bow. It's not a sign of worship. It's a sign of respect. It's, that's, all, that's all that is. So if that's the case, then what was the reason that Mordecai didn't bow? If that wasn't it, then why, why was it? Because, listen, it's going, to cost, it's going to cost all of his people their lives if God doesn't intervene, which God does. But this act is going to cause everybody to be killed. So why in the world did, did Mordecai not bow? This is, so what's up with Mordecai? What's up with you, Mordecai? Why in the world won't you bow? It's a sign of respect, for goodness sakes. Well, you've got to dig a little deeper to get the answer. And there is a lesson here that is hidden below the surface. And I love Esther because Esther, the whole story is about hidden things. They hide their, they hide their, their nationality. God is hiding in the background. He's hiding. And so there, there's this whole, whole thing about hidden things in the book of Esther. And here we have something that's hidden right here. God has hidden it for us to find out because we have to ask the question, what's up with Mordecai? Why did you not bow? Now, this is interesting. Verse 2, okay, let, let, first of all, chapter 2 talks about this plot. The last part of chapter 2 talks about this plot that uh, Mordecai happens to overhear about uh, these uh, two uh, two people wanted to wanted to get rid of the king he wanted to kill the king they were mad at him and so they uh, decided they were going to kill him well, Mordecai gets wind of it he tells Esther about it Esther then in the name of Mordecai tells the king and the king looks into the matter and sure enough these guys were, were doing it and so these guys were hung they were impaled actually the word hung is interesting there they were actually impaled upon a stake a terrible way to go, I would think. And immediately after this happens, it says in, in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, after these things. So immediately after this happens and they, and they thwart, this, thwart this thing, then the king does something that he do, doesn't explain why he does it, but it, it, he just says it. He exalts Haman above all the other servants and all the other people in the land. Now, I know the uh, King James says... Uh, uh, well, the King James says servants. They got it right. Uh, one, one of the translations puts, uh, uh, puts another, another word in there. But the word is, uh, the word is servant. Uh, it's o, uh, ovi, uh, um, Oved. Oved is servant. So uh, Oved is a, is a servant. And so uh, they, they are servants here. King, so it says uh, that he promoted Haman... The son of the, uh, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So now Haman is second in command to the king. Only the king is above him. Above this vast empire, only one person was above Haman, and that was the king. Wow. Now, this is interesting. Then it says that the king, all the servants that were in the king's gate or in the, in the, in the palace, they bowed and reverenced Haman and says, For the king had so commanded, 
Now, the King James says concerning him, the word in the Hebrew is literally to him. So the king has so commanded to him. To whom? To Haman. So now the servants, their only point of reference to who is making this command is Haman himself. So the scripture is telling us very, very, under, uh, uh, not, not plainly, but it's there, that Haman must have told all the other servants, hey, guess what? The king has said everybody should bow. Now, there's no law made, okay, because the law had to be published and it had to be passed throughout the land. We just saw that in chapter 1. There was no law made. But Haman is saying, the king said for everybody to bow. Now, if I was a servant, my first question would be, well, Haman, where's your proof? But the servants understand one thing in this kingdom, and that it is very dangerous to oppose people that have power. And Haman is the second most powerful person in the entire kingdom. All he has to do is frame his accusation right, and the, he could have someone else killed for doing absolutely nothing. And we're going to see that in just a few minutes because that's what, exactly what he does when he does with the king, with the, with the Jews. So the servants pretend, they say, we're just going to go along with it. And so all the servants began to bow to Haman. But they know that it's a farce. They know that it's a lie. They're not bowing because the king said so. They're bowing because Haman said so. And they're doing it because they're afraid of Haman. But Mordecai, he doesn't bow. Because he sees something that we miss sometimes. Who is it that gets bowed to generally? A king. So what I believe Mordecai saw was that Haman was taking that which didn't belong to him. He was taking the honor of a king, though he wasn't a king. Now, we're going to see that even further because later on, when, when uh, the king can't sleep, Haman comes in and, and the king, king says, uh, well, what shall be done to the man who, who, you know, the king wants to honor? And Haman goes, well, who, who should he want to honor except me? And so the king says, you know, who, who, what should we do? Haman says, well, man, give him the royal crown. Put him upon the royal horse. Put upon him the royal gar garments and have someone go in front of them saying this is who, what is done to the man who, want, uh, who the king wants to honor. He wants to look like the king. This is a, Haman's motivation. He doesn't want to be the king. Otherwise, he would, have a, he would have a coup and he would try to take over the, the, the throne. He didn't want to be the king because he didn't want the responsibility of being king, but he wants the honor of being the king. He wants, he wants to be the king in appearance only. He wants to be able to, to say things and that, that it be responded to as if he was king. Wow. It's amazing in churches, and I've been in churches since I was just, before, I, 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 I cut my teeth on, on, uh, on, on the uh, pews, and uh, I slept on sawdust in the sawdust revivals of the 50s. So I've been in church since before I was a baby. My, my mother, when I was in my womb, 
in the womb of my mother, my mother would take me to church <laughs> as a baby. And then I, I grew up in church. I grew up with a father that was a pa pastor of a Baptist church and a mother that was a minister in a Pentecostal holiness church. Pentecostal, uh, International Pentecostal holiness, not the Pentecostal holiness. That's one that's the International Pentecostal holiness. There's a little bit of, of a difference, IPHC. And so I, I, li I lived church 24 hours a day. We, we just lived it. And I've seen a lot of things over the years. And it seemed like there's always somebody in a, in a church. It seemed like there's always somebody that wants, they want to look like the pastor, but they don't want to be the pastor. They want to run things behind, his, behind the scenes, but they don't want to be the pastor. They don't want the leadership. They don't want the responsibility of leadership. See, but they're taking something that is not theirs. They weren't called that in that, in that position. They're not placed there. So it's interesting that Haman has got this attitude. Now here's the interesting thing. Mordecai is standing and he's not bowing, and Haman doesn't even notice it. Until the other servants come to him. Because think of this now, if you're a servant, you know you're, you know you're following this lie, but you know that you're trying, trying to curry favor. It looks bad on you when one person doesn't bow. So they come to Haman, or they come, I'm sorry, they come to Mordecai first, and they say, Mordecai, why are you not bowing? What's up with you, Mordecai? Mordecai, what's up with you? What's up with Mordecai? And that's the question that we're dealing with here is what's up with Mordecai? God is putting Mordecai through a test here. And we're going to show you that in just a minute. And so Mordecai doesn't answer a word to these servants. Now that frustrates him even more because he, he doesn't even tell them why. You know why? Because he says, he's thinking, you already know why. It's a joke. It's like somebody asking me why I don't wear a mask. When I, you know, because, because the mask has always been a joke. It was a joke from the very beginning. Somebody asked me why I, didn't get the, why I don't get the shot. Because it's a joke. Anybody that half a brain and one eye knows that it's, it's ridiculous. And yet they still, because, you know, they, they have to, they curry in favor. Go into a, some, no, some doctor's office, not all of them now, but some doctor's office, they, were, they, they require you to wear a mask in order to get their treatment or do whatever. And I'm going, of all people, the medical association knows the be better that a mask that's been sitting in my car for three weeks that I put upon my face is not going to protect me from anything. If anything, it's going to be unhealthy for me. And yet you're requiring me to put this unhealthy thing on my, on my face because you want to curry favor to somebody else with the CDC and with the AMA, American Medical, so medical Association. Because the powers that be tell you that's what they have to do because you haven't got the guts to stand up against them, I have to, I have to follow along with you if I want to get retreatment in your office. And you know it's a lie. So why, why do I not want to wear a mask? I don't have to answer that. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous question. So Mordecai doesn't answer him. And for a day after day after day, they come to it. And they say, Mordecai, why don't you bow? It's just a little thing. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's not even against any of your laws. 
He tells them that he's a Jew, but that doesn't, that's not why he, that's why he didn't bow. It's not against his laws. There's no harm in bowing. Why don't you just go ahead and go along with it? Mordecai said, no. Because Haman's taking something that doesn't belong to him. He's a thief. The interesting thing here is where it says, and they came to him day to day and he kept silence, is recorded in another place. Almost, it's actually in Hebrew, it's word for word. It's the only place in the, in the entire scripture where this is actually recorded. And it's when Joseph was getting away from Potiphar's wife. Joseph had been elevated in Potiphar's household to running everything in the house. He did all of Potiphar's affairs. He was second only to Potiphar. And the interesting thing is that his wife, Potiphar's wife, came to him day after day. And Joseph did not say a word. He just simply left. He never responded. He never talked to her. He didn't even offer or give her the time of day. Same thing. Because the stories, he wanted to connect them. Because there's a, the same reason that Joseph did not give in to Potiphar's wife is the same reason that Mordecai did not give in and bow to Haman. Because if Joseph had given in to Potiphar's wife, he had rule over everything. In fact, Joseph says this, I have rule, rule over everything. Why should I take his wife? That's the only thing I cannot have. I have everything else of Potiphar's. I can't have his wife. Now, see, Joseph could have went ahead and long with, with Potiphar's wife. He could have acted just like he was loyal to Potiphar and done all of his business and still had this fling going on at the side. Potiphar would never have been the wiser because only the two of them would know about it. But Joseph was loyal to Potiphar. And Malachi was loyal to the king. And Malachi th saw that Bowing to Haman, which be disloyal to the king. Just like Joseph would have been disloyal to Potiphar by giving in to Potiphar's wife. So the reason he didn't bow was because of loyalty. Because he was loyal to the person that was in charge. So when... Haman finds, when Haman finds out that Mordecai is not bowing, then he notices Mordecai is not bowing. Now he really gets angry. But the, so he, he has been heard now because of the, the servant says, tells him that he's the Jew. He's from the, he's been deported out of Judah, uh, Judah that he's of the deportation. That now, this anger in Haman stirs up. Now, who's Haman? So we, so this gets really, really good because this is another hidden thing about Haman. Haman is an Agagite. And what is an Agagite? It is a descendant of Agag. Well, who's Agag? Well, over in the book of uh, Samuel, we find out that Samuel had told King Saul to destroy all the Am Amalekites. The Amalekites, they had, they had come back when the Israelite was coming out of Egypt, and they had traveled completely out of their way, <laughs> completely out of their way. They, they, they weren't even going through the country of the Amalekites, but the Amalekites went completely out of their way to come and, and to attack Israel from behind and killing the weak, and the weak among them. But who are the Amalekites? Well, the Amalekites are descendants of Esau. So there was a deep-rooted 
hatred going all the way from Esau to the Amalekites to Agag because Samuel doesn't kill all the Amalekites. He, le he saves Agag alive. And Samuel then comes in there and he hacks Agag apart completely. But Agag's wife must have been pregnant. And we have a whole lineage now of Agagites. And so this Haman now, when he hears that he is a Jew, because Haman didn't know he's a Jew up there at this point. When he hears that he's a Jew, he remembers the stories of how his people and how his great, 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 great grandpa was hewed in pieces by Samuel. And how that the Israelites were going to completely destroy all the Amalekites. But they didn't destroy them. And now comes his opportunity to return the favor. Are you following me now? And so he then devises a way that he can convince the king. to kill all of the Jews. And he declares his decree. But here's the interesting thing about this whole thing, and this is the lesson that I want to talk about because we know the end of the story. I don't have to belabor that. That's what Purim is all about, this great victory that happened where Mordecai and Esther, they create a new law that they can defend themselves. <laughs> and there's another sermon beautiful sermon in that but there's another connection I wanted to see besides the connection that you have here when was it when was it look over here Let me see, where are we at here? Verse 12. Then were the king's, uh, king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. Day before Passover. The writer is now connecting us to Passover. It's very interesting here. I want you to watch something else now. So they're writing this law on the day before Passover. Mordecai hears about it. He puts on sackcloth, sets at the king's gate. Esther hears about Mordecai putting on sackcloth, rushes down to him, gives him clothes to put on. <laughs> Don't sit in the king's gate looking like that. He sends it back to her with a message saying, don't you know what's, what, what's, what's been passed today? She hears about this awful law. He tells her, he says, you need to go into the king and, 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 uh, and entreat the king for us. And she's, finally she says, yes. This all happened on that same day, day before Passover. So then, then we have, then we have, uh, then we have the, uh, uh, we have uh, verse uh, 16. And Esther then proclaims this fast. She said, go together, all together, the Jews that are presented in, in, in Sushan and fast for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night and day. So she gives this decree on the day of Passover. They then fast the next three days. I'm sorry, she, I'm sorry, she does this fast on the day before Passover. They fast three days, which gives them two days into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That they have the first banquet that she prepares for Haman and the king. 
Then she's going to have a second banquet the next night, which is on three, the three days after Passover. So it's four days after, after the, the first event, but three days after Passover. What happens three days after Passover? Yeshua is resurrected. And what happened on this, in this story three days after Passover? Haman is hanged. Haman is defeated and destroyed. Haman is a type of Satan. And not only that, not only that, but I'm going to take this even further. Because Satan, what was his, what was his position in heaven? He was, he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the covering cherub. He was second in command to God himself. And it wasn't good enough for him. And just like Haman, Hasatan, Lucifer at this time, he says, I will be like the Most High. Listen, he didn't say, I will be the Most High. He said, I will be like the Most High. In other words, I want to, I want to look like God but I don't want the responsibility of being God. And he touched that which was not his. And that's why Jesus said he was a thief from the beginning. Because he stole what was not his. Some people today have trouble with tithing. But listen to me. God says the tenth is mine, saith the Lord. If you're not tithing, you're stealing from God. Malachi, Malachi 3 says that. Will a man rob God? Listen, it's the same principle. It's because you're not loyal to the king. So if you're not tithing, you're not loyal to the king. And if you're not loyal to the king, you are stealing that which doesn't belong to you. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Because Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had every tree of the garden. They had everything in the garden. There was only one thing they couldn't have, and that was God's tree. But it wasn't good enough to have everything that God gave you. See, God gives you not God gives you nine percent, ninety percent of all your earnings. But that isn't good enough for you. You want hundred. Because you want to look like God. You want to look like you are in control of your finances. You know what a tithe is? That's a, a, an admission that you don't control your finances, that God controls it. That's an admission to God. God, you, I don't control it. You control it. Here's the part you said is yours. And you watch what God does with the rest of it. Skip knows that really well. You cannot take what is not yours. Last night, someone gave our piano player at our restaurant a $100 bill for playing. It happens occasionally. And he was busy playing. He was, in, he was involved in the song, and he just, li just laid it up on, because they handed it to him instead of putting it in his jar. And he, he just laid it up on the edge, and it was kind of teetering on the edge. And while he's playing, it falls off. He doesn't realize it. It falls off on the floor, and some, one, of the, one of the busters came by and picks it up. One of the, uh, one of the, uh, couple of the people that were sitting next to the piano, they see the buster pick up the $100 bill after it fell. And so it's, some, it's one of my regular people that normally asked for me. They didn't ask for me last night, but they did. They, they was, and so the, the guy motions for me out, out, out of the other room, and so I come over there, and, and I say, hey, how you doing? You know, because I haven't seen him in a while and everything. He says, i got to tell you something. He said, one of, your, one of the busters picked up a $100 bill off that floor. I go, really? He said, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll, I'll get, take care of it. I'll, I'll, I'll. So I went to the owner, and I went to the manager, and I got them both together, and I told them. Now, it so happened that it was, it was an innocent thing that happened. Okay? Thank goodness. 
Because what happened is they, did, they had assumed that it was the uh, uh, servers that was working the bar. So they came and gave it to her. And she said, well, it's not mine, but I'll, I'll keep it until, I, until we find out whose it is. So two mistakes were made there. The first one is that the buster should have taken it to a manager or to the owner instead of another server. The second thing is the server then should have also done the same thing, okay, because it's not her, our place to find out about these things. It's their, it's their place. We're too busy serving customers. They can, they can take off whatever they're doing, and they can do whatever they, you know, they can find out about these things. So anyway, the money did get to the right place eventually. But the point is, is that you can't take what's not yours. And I'm so thankful that the busters were honest, that they had loyalty. You see, they exhibited loyalty that day. That spoke volumes to me. Now I, now I can trust them. I can trust them when I see them clearing off the table and I haven't got there to pick up the book yet. I can trust them. And I might give them an extra little tip from time to time just because I can trust them. Just to let them know that I really appreciate the fact that I can trust them. That's what's called loyalty. Loyalty. You can't take what is not yours. But this idea that this whole thing is happening down on Passover is just amazing. And that it was at the second feast, three days after Passover, when you figure it here, that Haman is taken out and hung on the gallows. And Mordecai is elevated. He's lifted up. He's resurrected. He went from becoming a dead man in sackcloth and ashes to becoming the second in command with the king's ring on his hand. Just like, just like Joseph got the king's ring. There's a rabbinical saying that the sons, the sons of, of uh, Rachel have the same reward And the and the same and the same uh, uh, they, 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 they're in the same uh, uh, situations, the same uh, judgments, the same test. And so, who are the two sons of Rachel? They are Joseph and Benjamin. Now, here's another little thing. I just want to throw this out just in case you think that this whole story is just something that exa happened in the Bible times. Do you know where per present day Persia is? Iran. And Iran is doing something, they're working at their hardest to get an atomic bomb because they shout in their streets Death to Israel, death to America. It's the same spirit of Haman. The same spirit of the Amalekites. The same spirit of Esau. The same spirit of Hasatan. That wants to destroy the people of God off the face of the earth. And in these last days, in these last days, I believe that many of us will become martyrs for Christ. We can get excited about the revival. And I certainly am excited about that. But I'm going to tell you something. Loyalty to the king is going to be tested. We sang today, I will follow him. 
He conquered death. I will follow him. Your loyalty to the king, just like Joseph's loyalty was tested, just like Mordecai's loyalty was tested, is going to be tested in these last days, whether you're going to be loyal or not. Or will you take that which is not yours to take? Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yivarakaka, Yahweh the Ishmaelaka, Yair Yahweh Penavileka Vikanaka, Isa Yahweh Penavileka Vyasemdaka, Shalom. The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and he will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you and he will give you peace. Amen. Amen.